So the wave balls have a cut and something inserted, but it's not straight, it's on a curve. And he developed this mechanism, and you'll see a fantastic demo next week if you tune in. And so I thought about a jig to do it myself. So this is um, one that I did, and this is the jig I used. The thing that got me to use this jig was when I first tried to do it, and this was before I built the jig, I tried to do it twice so that I would have the curve in both directions. But they aren't precise. So you can see they're a little narrow, one's a little narrower, one's a little fatter. So I needed precision. So I'll pass this around if you want to look at it. So I made this jig, which is based on what I saw from him, and you'll see a better view of it. But um, so what this jig has is it's got holes on the bottom. It's a bandsaw jig, so we can't get to the bandsaw here, but imagine that the bandsaw blade is over here. I've got pins on the bottom. I can raise and lower this um, as, you know, with these different holes. I have a pin here so that I can rotate this, and I can rotate it precisely um, by counting the number of holes. So it's just like, you know, the, you're indexing. And so based on that, if I pick a swivel point, I could turn this through and get the, and get a cut like that, and that's how I did this uh, this bowl. You know? So do you, do you have a base out, I'm assuming that that pin goes into. Yeah, my, I couldn't bring mine because it wouldn't fit on this bandsaw anyway. It would be hard to see, but yeah. but I have a, a plywood table. Yeah. Um, I've got a piece of T-track that's got a pin in it that fits these holes. Um, the table slides in, so I can slide it in place. The pin yeah. is, is parallel to the, or perpendicular to the blade, yeah. so I can set the distance that I want, and then I can pivot it for a curved um, cut. Now, well, so it doesn't have to be a curved cut. You could put this on a miter slot. If you wanted to cut something straight, you could cut it through the blade. If you wanted to cut it on an angle, and sometimes you see these pieces where the top is kind of angled, and you could push it through that way. Um, Thanks to Doug for leaving this lying around here, so I had something to, to I'll show. Can I interrupt for a second? Yeah, yeah. Just so I understand, and this one in particular. So you have a, a curved piece of wood that you've cut on the bandsaw. One side's parallel with the other. But so the wood doesn't have to be... It, together? It, it doesn't have to be... Okay, but it, 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 As long as I'm holding it in the chuck, mm -hmm. you know, it could be roughed out, you know, it wouldn't be finally... Um, but as long as I have it in the chuck, so I would rough it out, put it in the chuck, attach it to the machine. Right. And then when I swing the arc, then I get one of those lines. Yes. Um, now I have two pieces. Um, and then I get a piece of thin wood, yes. which I soak in water. Oh, the thin wood is the... And then yeah, I put the thin is. wood in to fill... I'm sorry, I should have explained that. So it's almost like a, a, a stringy. Uh, if you go set the thin wood now, yeah. handles that contour. Yeah, the two, right. the two pieces of wood then, since I've, I've made the wood plastic, by I wet it, I put it in the microwave, I got it hot. Okay. I've glued it, and I'm not glued, I clamped it between the two to give it some shape. Okay. When it dries, I glue it together. I got you. Then I rotate this 90 degrees. Sure. And then I do the same thing, and that's how I could get another cut. And in theory, and, and you'll see, Beaver will show some pieces where he's done five, six, seven different cuts. Mm -hmm. And he does much fancier things with it where the the um, the inserts protrude out and all of that, but that's the basic uh, basic principle. So it's pretty simple to make. This was set up for my Laguna because only a one inch. Uh, two rests only one inch. And I have another piece of one inch pipe. It's actually an inch and a quarter on the outside that I can use on my Vic Mark because it has an insert that comes out. It'll fit right in there. So you just put it in there. And then you just, just loosen this up. You move this anywhere you want it. That's and clever. Just screw the chuck yeah. right out here. And you can just turn this. So Cheaper the work than you're going to work on is on the chuck. And instead of removing it, and now just remove the chuck. Then, then, then you can do stuff and put it right back on the lathe. And you have to do some turning, or, or something happens, you got to turn it off. You can just turn it off because it's, you have to change it. You're not going to be out of round.
And it's a lot cheaper than a Trent Bosch carving stand. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Don't ask me how I know. You probably can't bend in as many directions as you can with a regular carver's device, but for what I do it, boy, this thing's and Donna, where did you get the actual thread that matches the spindle nose? That's I bought that from the Master from. Car. And then you welded it, or was no? It's a this here piece here was a this here is a uh, inch and a quarter. Well, I think it's an inch and a quarter plug. The inside there is just about one inch. Okay, in fact, it's a little less, and I just. Ground a little bit, put super glue, and shove it in there. Oh. <laughs> it's been there about for 10 years. You know. Very clever. Yeah. It looks pretty good. Terrible. And when you're looking for a 7 16 inch wrench, that's you're looking for a wrench right there. Don't go away. So, you could really, you could really get the. Uh, you could turn them and you had this, you could turn it, you know, and you have the, the shape, but you can't have, you couldn't get this little hollow out of the car. So what you do with this thing, you take the piece of wood before you put it on the vein, put it in there, lock it down. Wow. Where the hell did you come up with this? Oh my goodness. Look at that. I don't know if any of you have tried turning spheres uh, without a jig. You can buy fancy jigs, but turning them without a jig. You, you can start the, the block between centers and you get your first cut. Then you got two little pieces sticking out on the end. You got, the next thing you got to do is turn it 90 degrees. Now you got to hold the thing. Uh, you can buy crazy things to do it, but you can also make them. So <clears throat> what you need is two pieces with a radius that's smaller than the radius of your, your sphere so that the cup is actually holding it. Mm -hmm. This one will just screw right onto the uh, tail stock. Onto the, let me take this off. Three-quarter thread. Yeah, it's a three-quarter by ten thread. You can buy the nuts at uh, Home Depot or Lowe's, mm -hmm. and so you can put the thing right on there in the tailstock. Mm -hmm. And on this piece, you put a Morris taper on it, <laughs> right in the headstock. Now, if you've tried turning a Morris taper, you know that's a pain in the neck. Uh, you can get a machinist handbook and get the angles and try and lay it out. Good luck. <laughs> you can do it trial and error, more good luck. But why not make a little simple little thing? More staple. Oh. Mm. Wait, Tim, I didn't catch that. Am I saying what you're doing again? Thanks. I, um, now, yeah, I yeah, okay. now you can do it by eye yeah. and just check your fit. You gotta take a little That's off right, here, yeah. a little off there. Uh -huh. Perfect. And the simple way to make this, again, you could try measuring and laying out the lines. I don't recommend that. The easiest way to make it is to have your base piece ready, have your two side pieces. Go ahead and put one of the side pieces fasten it down then you can just lay a more taper right, right in there, there. Yeah. and yeah. put the other one up against it yeah and you're set to go wow nice Clever. just so simple now if you don't want to buy the nuts you can also and get a tap uh-huh and you can take your chunk of wood and just tap the three quarter inch hole into the wood, drill a three quarter, this is, it's, uh, yeah, it's three quarter. You need to have a little clearance hole in there for the very nose of this thing to go in. 
but you can go ahead and the way to start it is to take your piece of wood or you can hold it in a vise or something, get it all drilled on your drill press, tap it, and then you can take the wood and thread it right onto here. And then this piece, you can now put in here, and instead of putting this thing in to lock it, you can put a little piece of coat hanger, bend the wires over, or I have a little skinny little bolt nut that they just stick down in here, and this is a drive center. To, um, to a piece of plywood and the bowl that's in here, this is used to hold the bowl um, so you can turn the bottom off without having a vacuum. Uh, it's good also if you have a vacuum but you have pieces that are very porous or ambrosia, it's full of holes. I put some felt tape on here so the piece won't get marred. On the inside of this piece over here is foam um, that I got from Michael's or one of those places and I used the Scotch adhesive. The hole that's in the middle of the faceplate goes all the way through. So this can also be a vacuum plate. So if, if you have a vacuum chuck, but you have something with a weird shape that you don't have a vacuum drum for, I use the foam. And you know those templates that they sell that people used to trace circles before they bandsaw something? It looks like a bullseye. It's clear plastic and it's got the concentric circle. Not using this. And I did the concentric circle so I can kind of get this piece centered easily by looking at where it is on the bullseye without so I try to center it. And then I made this piece, uh, this red one. I did it red so I can see the piece in the middle more easily when it's spinning. And then I realized I had an odd shaped piece that I wanted to hold. So rather than remake this whole disc, I cut a hole and made these cleats. And now I have these different inserts of different sizes that can go in here and they all have the felt tape mm -hmm. as to not mar the piece. And it works really well. And if you don't have a vacuum chuck or you can't afford one, mm -hmm. this is a nice solution. And it didn't cost much except for some plywood. Mm -hmm. Some nuts and bolts and an expensive face plate. Mm -hmm. So and that's the cleats that. are just bolted through. Mm -hmm. The cleats are just. And there's a company called Burden Gun Drills, and they happen to be five minutes from my house, and they're one of the leading people in the country for, for gun drills. And if anyone wants the information, I can get it for them. Um, gun drill is you guys used in the gun making industry. You normally inject fluid into this has a hollow hole in it. And you inject oil when you're drilling out metal. Mm -hmm. Trent Bosch sells the handle. I bought the gun drill. This gun drill is really good. It's got a carbide tip on it. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I use this for getting my depth hole uh, when I'm doing a hollow form very quickly. And with the air shooting in through this, mm -hmm. it e ejects the chips. Mm -hmm. There's no burning, there's no heat, and it literally takes seconds to get your depth hole. Mm -hmm. I've only used it a few times. Um, I improved on it just the other day when I was measuring my piece, which was eight and a half, and I took a tape measure and I put some tape at eight because I wanted my bottom to be a half inch. So I said, that's ridiculous. So I took the ruler and marked off every inch on the inside of the, the drill bit where the, um, where the flute is so it won't rub off, I don't think, and I put one, two, three, four every inch. Mm -hmm. So now I just go in, if I know I want eight, I just stop at the line that says eight. Mm -hmm. And it works really, really well. And I got it with the intent of making a lamp, which I haven't done yet. And I have a robust, and my, my older robust does not have a through tail stock like a lot of the lathes have. So if you have the through tail stock, you could just, excuse me, send this right through, mm -hmm. and this will act as a guide to keep it straight. Mine doesn't <clears throat> have that, and it would be an expensive <clears throat> thing to, to have mine machined. So I had this extra box rest from Best Wood Tools that I wasn't using because I got a better one from Robust and I just kept it thinking I'd give it to someone someday. And the company that made the gun drill, I asked them if they had any metal tubing that was the, the same diameter as the drill mm -hmm. and the guy did and he gave it to me and I went to a welder 
and the welder solder uh, welded the tube onto the box rest. Mm -hmm. So I have it perfectly 90, 90 degrees to the box rest. So I use this as a guide to keep my gun drill dead straight. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about the lateral movement. Mm -hmm. I just get this parallel to the waist. Mm -hmm. And basically when I do want to drill the chucks here, the woods here, mm -hmm. I just go in that quickly and come back out and I got my depth hole. So that's a great little tip. There. Just something I came up with. I don't have to use it very much. But if anyone wants a gun drill, the place is called Burden, B U R D E N. And they're in. This $5 jig uh, saved me $7,000, <laughs> which I'll have to explain. I don't know if I have time. Uh, <laughs> but uh, any of you have like vibration with your lathe? You ever put a piece of wood on and it vibrates? Mm -hmm. yeah, do, do you do anybody do multi-axis? Yeah. Because yeah. that really vibrates. Yeah. Uh, so you if you ever get a, a lathe that has a swivel headstock, you will never get rid of it because you just can't stand bending over the waves. You don't want to slide it down the way these slide down. That's a science project. Uh, you want to swivel it. Uh, that swivel is just it's two pieces of cast iron. So, I, uh, for 15 years, I kept adding weight to my lathe, and with the Nova design, it makes no difference. I discovered less than a year ago that Vicmark, one of my favorite lathes, makes a swivel headstock. And I figured Vicmark, Vicmark with the quality of their stuff, which I love, uh, it, it's it's going to be solid. I, I've just seen it on videos. I've seen these guys do hollowing with this big mark swiveled out, and they are solid as a rock. <clears throat> I, you know, I did my specs. I had my money in the bank. I had seven thousand dollars, and <clears throat> I'm about to order it. And I go into my shop Sunday before the week that I was going to make the big sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So, getting rid of the Nova. I'm going to get the big mark. I'm going to try one more thing. <clears throat> if you have vibration and you study, I put a big piece of off-balance wood on my Nova, <laughs> and I turn it on, and it's variable speed. I, I crank up the speed. Uh, first thing you will figure out is the most vibration is at the highest point of the headstock. Makes sense when you think about it. With my Nova, it is pivoting, you know, off that very lousy connection they have to the waves. So it's the second thing you'll notice, if you really crank it up and watch it move, is um, it's not vibrating this way. It's not vibrating up and down. It's all, it's going that way. So I'm like, my wave happens to be this far from the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and this is one third of my three piece, $5, $7,000 substitute. <clears throat> the Nova, which has a cast iron headstock, it, it's got a, uh, a sheet metal plate covering up the guts on one side, which very conveniently has seven machine screws holding that plate on perpendicular to the axis of the lathe. So step one, get a piece of heavy steel and take up two of those machine screws and screw that in nice and tight, nice piece of heavy steel. Imagine it's in this plane. Mm -hmm. My lathe is parallel to the wall that's that far away. Step two, a nice strong piece of steel angle with pretty precisely, you know, holes. I don't want to have a lot of play. So I've got a hole at the top of this steel bar coming up. And I've got this angle iron with a, you know, screwed into it. Part three is a much heavier piece of angle iron uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the stud, and I was really lucky. I mean, I could have moved my lathe, mm -hmm. you know, no more than eight inches either way, but I got lucky. I didn't have to move it. It was, there was the stud. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> the, 
four big lag bolts, lag screws, mm -hmm. on that heavy piece of angle iron in the wall, in the stud. Mm -hmm. So that's my three part thing. I've got wing nuts because I still want to swivel, but all your vibration is on axis. Now for the test. It's Sunday night, it's taken me three hours, and uh, I put that big wonky piece of wood on the, it's on a face plate, and I start cranking it up. Now your typical shop has all kinds of crap hanging from the ceiling. I've got all, all my wood racks, all my, all my form, heavy cast iron tools, tools with sharp points. Wow. This stuff is all over, and I'm connected to the wall. So I crank this and I think, you know, this is either going to work or I'm going to get buried when everything <laughs> is tumbling down. So I crank it up, I'm cranking it up. It is rough. I don't know what is in that stud. <laughs> I, I hit a magic stud. It, it does not move. The garage does not move. Mm. And I, well, I figure my garage is probably about 10,000 pounds. And I think I have a 10,000 pound leg. I originally made a, a plywood disc with some hardened steel screws and it worked great and I had a, a bolt in the middle for registering uh, blanks. So this is actually Ames uh, Griggs one which I finally gave in and uh, spent the 99 bucks I think it was at the time. Um, uh, obviously this just goes on. You drill a 7 16th hole, you can slap a large chunk of wood on that and rough it out really, really quickly. So, when I'm telling you, one more thing I want to tell you um, that, that stud in the middle, I believe, is the same diameter as the studs that's in a robust live center if you turn around the point. Really? So, you can reverse your piece and you have a center reference point. This this in a not in a one way but in a robust if you take this point yeah. out and turn it around yeah it, i believe it's that size uh, I so you can turn the piece around and you'll have your centers lined up that i didn't know because on that point and it's it is a great point so when i when i'm actually roughing a, a blank out i do have because the live center's there i always mark the center and the reason i do that is because because i typically will twice turn this is a this is a Glen knockoff, um, so it's just a simple plywood plate. Um, you cut out a groove in the in the centre because after the um, after the bowls have dried, they will have warped, and they'll warp along the uh, uh, along the axis. So you need a little bit of relief there. This is just an anti-slip um, oh, shelf cool. mat. Yeah. Because I've marked the center on the tenon, the tenon will have warped as well. But if you, as long as you mark the center, you can get the bowl centered up yeah. back on there, and then you can you can true it back up, re true the tenon, true the outside. Now, Alan always asks me questions on Instagram when I'm using this. It is this is great for truing up bowls. Um, I have bowls of all different sizes and the one thing that inhibits me is if a bowl is not over the edge you have to stop before you suddenly cut into your jig so I was thinking about I've been thinking about this and I think what I might do is have a standard plywood face plate much like this and then make a selection of sizes so that I can lay the bowl right the way across so I can actually true right the way through mm -hmm. and use um, threaded inserts and use that to sort of clip different size plates onto the front so I've got multiple sizes of this. Mm -hmm. um, can, I, can I ask a question because a, a lot yeah. of place turn bowls are very often placed either on a, a large chuck mm -hmm. with the jaws expanded or maybe even something that fits on the inside of the rough. Yep. Now, do you find that this gives you more stability as you, okay. Yeah. I can, um, I was actually, I was using this today um, and to the point of vibration, I mean, I have a Powermatic, 
Um, I was I had a, a bowl that had been drying for about a year. It was it was out of true. I could remount it and turn at twelve hundred. Mm -hmm. oh. How deep is your relief there in the center? It's just down. It, uh, this one's uh, half inch. And that's enough. That's enough. And and as far as material on here, I mean, I used as I say, I used some non-slip um, draw liner. Um, I wouldn't necessarily do that again. I think what I would do is go to a local dive shop, ask them about um, wetsuits, mm -hmm. and just use neoprene. That's mm -hmm. what that is, I think, but thinner. Yeah. It's cheap. Yeah. It's like three dollars a sheet. Yeah. If you go to the dive shop, it's free. Yeah. They'll give you an old. Um, they'll give you an old wetsuit mm -hmm. for nothing. Um, this is another carving jig, but this is um, this is Carl Ford's design, or it's a modification of Carl Ford. Mm -hmm. So if you go to Carl's website, um, he has all the designs up there. Um, so similar to Don's, it's got a handle. The one thing that uh, that Carl uh, did is he recommends cutting a, a plywood handle that he then epoxies the uh, the nut into. I decided I was just going to drill and thread it, and I've got a lathe, so I can turn a handle, <laughs> which actually looks a bit uh, looks a bit better. But the the difference um, is you can put the chuck on there as Don was describing, mm -hmm. but as you want to turn it, you can lock it in place quite simply. Mm -hmm. And change the angles. So, and Carl is even good enough to put the complete parts list for McMaster car, including part numbers. So if anyone wants to make it, they're dead simple to make. This, this I made with hand tools. Segmented bowl turning. I haven't done any segmented turning, but I happened to come across this and, and I thought, well, I've got some cash back uh, rewards that I needed to use or wanted to use. My wife didn't know about. This is, this is a company. Um, I think they're in New Hampshire. I happened to stumble across them. Um, it's uh, called Mitre Set, oh. and they have two jigs. One is for setting the angle of the uh, the mitre gauge for the table saw, mm. um, and they have this one. So, of course, if you want to do segmented turning. There could be a fair bit of math involved, but with this, you know, if you want to do four segments per, it's easy because it's 45 degrees. But if you want to do, I don't know, 11 segments, mm -hmm. what's the math? So here you would just put a pin in zero, pin in 11, lay your mitre gauge in there. Oh wow! And you just literally turn the face of the mitre gauge, oh. and you've got the angles. Wow! Oh um, math. basically slides in there and so you can you're then flipping this around and putting it over here so I can go into the bottom of a bowl and this this is threaded into the post um, so I can go quite deep with it and it's really quite rigid this is actually a tool rest off of a little old Rockwell lathe that was I got as junk but the whole idea is that you can get right down in there and it takes the scariness out of turning the bottom of the bowl so. mm -hmm. I made this so that this is the minimum length of the tenon, maximum length of the tenon, minimum thickness, minimum width, maximum. And so I made one for each of the different um, uh, chucks and um, jaws that I have. So also for um, doing uh, recess chucking, I basically did the, the same kind of thing where I have the the um, minimum di uh, depth of the recess, minimum diameter of the recess, maximum diameter, maximum depth. That's great. So of, of the different um, the jaw jaws that I have. Um, also designed um, inserts for um, vacuum port, two and a half inch, so I can adjust it to big festival and then small festival. Oh, that's cool. So, um, and then, um, for adjusting the um, platform on my CBN wheels, mm -hmm. because the wheel does not change diameter, I could uh, fix it. And I also wanted a 25 degree setup gauge uh, for uh, sharpening my skew, which I didn't find anywhere. 
So I designed this, and all I have to do is put this there and up, you know, mm -hmm. just and, and then lock it in place, and it's good. And uh, very easy. I made a whole bunch of other angles too. Uh -huh. And all these designs I actually shared on Thingiverse, so if you have a 3D printer, you can print these. <laughs> the, um, the final one is for festival fans. And um, a lot of people, you buy the MFT and you have the miter gauge on the back, which takes up a lot of room. So what I did was I designed these, which um, knob and so this part goes from the top of the table down this little mechanism will clamp onto the back fence and so two of these and you're referenced against the holes and the thing is dead 90 against the um, against the holes mm -hmm. so I actually offered this on, on Thingiverse also and then a bunch of people said can you print one for me and I ended up selling a bunch so um, yeah that's our really Nice. You, do, uh, you do lottery? <laughs> <laughs> Bingo! I, I use a lot of different materials and I use compact cement to glue them onto these plywood cylinders. So these are actually, you can buy these from certain specialty uh, plywood dealers. They're actually made for conference room cables and you can buy them from, these are six inch diameter, and they go all the way up to, you know, a couple of feet sometimes. So I have a couple of jigs at the house where I, I um, hold that and then I cut it with the table saw to cut it lengthwise. So in the case of the jewelry box, there, there are two cylinders that are, one is gonna be stationary and the other has a hinge and that's the door to the jewelry box. So this jig is all about how do you put either veneer or I also have been buying this patinaed copper, very thin sheet, and it's on the expensive side, but some beautiful stuff. And what was happening is because the contact cement, you basically put it on two sides, right? You put it on the side, bottom side of your veneer or your, your metal, and then you put a contact cement on this, and then you wait about 15, 20 minutes. Okay, well, the tricky part is laying it down on here and being able to roll it without getting any bubbles. That's the million dollar problem. Because I was I was like making every other one that had a problem where I was throwing it out. And these are expensive pieces of plywood and then with the veneer, it's like, well, this isn't gonna work. So I came up with this jig and this has a little locking pin, but these rods are the same concept if you ever see like where they do kitchen countertops or such with the laminate, where they use all the wooden dowels and you just lay them between. So then you're exposing, you're keeping the laminate up off of the top of your, your, your workbench or your, your, your tabletop. And then you, you go down into the middle and then you slowly start pulling the rods out. Well, that's what this concept is here. And so, um, and then I have this little locking pin so that I can hold it. So that goes in the side here. So what I would typically do for, this is again, a half cylinder. I would have the center lines marked and then I would bring this in here and I would hold it. So then I would just remove this top one. And again, sorry I didn't bring the veneer, but I'll use a piece of paper as an example. So assuming the contact cements here, you know, it's cut to the same, you know, the proper length. So I would be able to lay it in there like that, and then I would be able to come down and just make point contacts, and then start keep rubbing it, rubbing it, rubbing it, and not to the point where it's attached like that, okay? So life is good. So then I would just pull the pin out, rotate it to the next spot. Pull the next rod out. Meanwhile, if you'll notice, this is all hanging off here. It still has all the glue underneath but it's, it's flopping in the breeze and staying away from this part. So then, you know, you just pull out another one. And then you just start, you know, working your way down. And that's the idea. And so you just continue to work your way all the way around. And I've never had one fail since I've done this. So it works really well. And I haven't done it yet, but I have the materials for it. 
I also was doing full cylinders, and that's a little trickier because as you bring the, the two pieces around, now you have to have a nice seam or a lack of a seam, right? If you really don't want to see the seam. And so something Doug, you and I learned in terms of when you do the veneering, it's the bell cut concept where if you cut two pieces of veneer that are overlapping on a bevel, then when you lay them together, you get a beautiful, essentially seamless kind of a fit there. So one of the ideas I have here is make some a little bit more of an extension. And I have a, a rod with a linear bearing, it's gonna slide on it, and I have an X-Acto knife attached to it. And so I'll be able to, the vision I have is be able to run it down and cut those two pieces together and then it'll just blend together perfectly. So mm -hmm. that's the concept. So that's that. That's that's my main chick for the night. A, a YouTube channel of woodworking uh, at the end of November. And more recently, I, I put out a video on, you know, the ultimate push stick for your table saw. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so to me, this, this thing is a thing of beauty. That's <laughs> what it's One of my titles, I said, if Apple was designed a push stick, this is what it would look like, okay? So, I mean, a lot of push sticks definitely, including maybe some I've had, you know, they're just a piece of cheap uh, plywood and they're sacrificial, right? Where you're running them through to the point where there's nothing left and you throw them out. So it takes maybe 10 minutes to make another one. But I thought, you know what? I'm a woodworker. I like looking at really nice looking things. Why not make a really nice push stick? So, you know, this concept, I mean, this is a thing of beauty. Look at this foam handle, okay? <laughs> Most of them have just rounded over three quarter inch stick, you know, plywood handles. No, no. This no. thing, you just love squeezing it. It's so cool, so good. <laughs> Maple handle. Now, the walnut, it's actually plywood, a plywood core. And I have veneered the plywood. Oh, I mean, I, yeah, veneered the plywood uh, with uh, real walnut. And then I bought some two inch wide edge banding that has the uh, hot melt glue on the back. And so then I was able to make these nice curves and then I edge banded the whole piece. And then on the bottom, to give it a better grip, I put a little rubber grip because as you'll see, some commercial push sticks do have a rubber grip. <laughs> And then I made this maple end stop because oh, you need yeah. to be able to push your piece right through the table saw. So you, you need a, an end piece. This is automatically for your different thicknesses of wood. A lot of times you'll see on, on the internet, you know, they'll just screw a little piece on there. And I said, well, that isn't going to cut it with my Apple design push stick. <laughs> so, um, yeah, these are little knobs and so on. And that's this one. Now, if you think this one's cool, silly question, why not just use a scrap piece? You have to rip really thin strips of wood on your table saw. You're going to need to actually run your jig, your push block, right over the blade. And so this has a detachable, sacrificial piece on the bottom. Now, this is made out of solid maple. I was going to say, okay. it's, not <laughs> it's, it's not veneer. <laughs> it's not veneer. The body is veneer. You may wonder, all right, well, how did, how did I attach this? I attached this with this special uh, 3M. It's, it's like a unisex type of interlocking fastener. It's not Velcro. It's something that is unbelievable strong. I use it in exterior um, industrial applications and so forth. But... I, in part of my video, I did a test, and I was able to attach this equivalent of this to a 30-pound bucket of rock salt, and I was able to lift the whole thing up, and it holds. That's how strong that stuff is. Because my concern, of course, is having this on here, this is darn well had better be strong and attached because we can't have I thought I invented sliced bread with this concept. Now, it wasn't terribly popular on YouTube, but I still think it's great. Um, if you've seen the, the Max Switch feather boards, they're yellow, and they use these really strong magnets, right? So they'll stick to, they'll stick to anything. And, and you use it on your table saw and, and other tools as you need to. And you turn this with a quarter turn, and you cannot get this thing off. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, this thing is really locked on. But, 
this other company called Bo Products, they came out with this, this green thing, and they have these, these high density foam little fingers. And these things are really cool because when you're mounting this up on the table saw, they have these um, knobs on them that would go in your miter slot like, like normal, right? That's why these slots are here. Um, and then these fingers are able to capture it so it keeps your wood up against your fence. But then if the part, part was to come back, it reduces it because these little fingers interlock. So it is really a cool design. But again, you have to deal with all the knobs, right? All the time and moving it around. And I said, well, I can do better than that. And so that's where I combined it. So I called it the featherboard hack, where I combined you know, the mag switch with these magnets along with their tool. I made this little insert and um, rounded it out and then just mounted it. On the bottom, you know, I modified the actual feather board itself by cutting holes so these would go through. But again, with a quarter turn, and now I'm also not limited to the miter slide and the saw. I can move it anywhere around. So anyway, 